Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. If you could have right now anything in all of creation, what would you desire? What would you want to experience? Well, if you were to ask Moses that question, it, it wouldn't be something that was physical, something that had a monetary value, something that was, was beautiful to the human eye because of some craftsman, some artistry, some, some splendor that was made by human hands. No. You know what Moses was seeking? You know what he was desperate for? What he was pursuing? What he was praying for? Just one answer to that, based upon our passage of Scripture tonight. Moses was seeking the presence of God. And learn from Moses tonight this principle. And that is when you are in God's presence, everything is going to be different. It will bring a massive change to your life. It is God's presence that is the basis for transformation. Not just transforming who you are, but also the situation that you're in. God, and I love this passage in the book of Psalms, where it says we, we go to sleep at night weeping, but we wake up joyfully. Why? Well, while we're asleep and doing nothing, God, the scripture says he never slumbers or sleeps. God is constantly moving. And God can bring change to take a bad situation, one that is, is grievousome, one that is stressful, one that is hurting, one that seems hopeless. And while we sleep, God is able to transform, to change, to bring that into something that is praiseworthy. See, before we go any further to see him, we need to be people that give thanks, glory, praise, and honor to God. That's what Moses was seeking when he desired God's presence. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus chapter 33. Now, we left off last week with verse 11. And, and there was someone who was mentioned there, and that is Joshua. Joshua who was standing by the entrance of the tent. And there he was faithful. We see a connection between faithfulness, steadfastness, and Joshua. And I want to talk about that name for a moment. The name in Hebrew, Yehoshua. Now, Joshua can also, and he's called by a different enunciation of this name. He is called as well, for example, in Nehemiah, Sefer Nehemiah, and chapter 8, he is called Yeshua. Not as some mispronounce the name of Messiah by saying Yahashua. Never in the scripture do we see that. No, we see Yeshua. And I won't go into the significance of the grammar and why it's important not to create names, but utilize biblical names because of their revelation. What those names convey means. So, Yehoshua is also called Yeshua. He's also called Hoshea, the one who makes salvation. And Joshua is mentioned at this key critical place Exodus 33 and verse 11, for a reason. 
Because Joshua, this name who means God makes salvation, he's the Savior. That gives us a theological framework for understanding the passage that we're going to be studying this evening. A very significant passage. And it's not my opinion alone. In fact, my opinion was, was based upon the sages of Israel. Now, we know that each week in the synagogue, there is a Torah portion read. We call that the parasha. Simply means portion. And we know that there are 54 different parashiot, 54 different Torah portions that are read. You say, why 54? Because a typical Jewish year has 40 excuse me, 50 weeks. But leap year has 54 because of an extra month. And we know that the Hebrew calendar is not like the Gregorian calendar. It's not based solely upon the sun, but also the moon. Both play a role. So there's 54 weekly Torah portions. On a typical year, we read some weeks two portions instead of one. But there's also another reason for this, and that is because of two very special Shabbats. What two Shabbats am I speaking of? Well, I'm speaking about Shabbat Chuamuet. Now, what does that mean? Chol is a typical day, a normal day. In festivals, we have what's called the high Sabbath, that is the festival day, like the first day and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Also, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that special day, immediately after the festival of Sukkot Tabernacles ends, there's an additional festival day called Shemeni Etzeret, the Eighth-day Assembly. These are high Sabbaths, and they can fall on any day of the week. But pay attention to this. There are two, according to the Torah, we're going to set Hanukkah, an eight-day festival, aside. But there are, according to the Torah, two seven-day festivals. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles called Sukkot. And within these seven days, on most years, there is a Shabbat. And that Shabbat is called Shabbat Chuamued. It is the Sabbath, not of the high Sabbath, but within this seven-day period. And because it's a special Shabbat within a festival, there's a special reading that accompanies it. And what is that? Well, it begins with where we're going to be reading today. It continues on into chapter 34, which we will read next week. But this evening, we're going to read from Exodus 33, verse 12, until the conclusion of this chapter, verse 23. And this passage was selected for both the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Shabbat that falls within the seven-day period, and the Shabbat that falls within the seven-day period of the Feast of Tabernacles. Two very important festivals, and therefore a very important reading from the Torah. I hope that you're interested in this passage. It is highly significant and reveals powerful truth. So let's begin. Exodus chapter 33, verse 12. Moses spoke to the Lord. Now, this is unique because usually we find the expression, I mentioned this last week, Vedeber Hashem el Moshe. And the Lord spoke to Moses. But here we have the expression, Vayomer Moshe el Hashem. And lo, Moses said to the Lord. Now, why is Moses speaking? Because he wants to state to God that he's understood something, that he has the right perspective. Now, in this 12th verse, there's a word, ra'eh. 
and it means see. It's a word of understanding, a word of perception. And Moses is saying to God, see God, and the implication is, I get it, I understand it, I have the right perspective. Now, we know something. Over and over in this book of Exodus, Moses has been chosen by God to lead the people into the promised land, to bring them up, remember that phrase, to bring them up from Egypt into the promised land. And notice what Moses says to God. He wants God to see that he understands it, his call. And he says, see, you say unto me. And it's in the participle form in Hebrew, which speaks about God saying this. And it's in the present, which means over and over again. Moses says, you know, God, you said this a lot to me. And I get it. I understand it. For you have said unto me, bring up this people. But you have not made known to me whom you will send with me. Now, remember, I said two weeks ago that God, at the end of chapter 32, he says to Moses, my messenger I will send before you. Who is this messenger? And last week, God reaffirmed this. He spoke again about this messenger that he would send. And Moses gets it. He understands it. In order for him to complete his call, he can't do it in and of himself. It's only in connection, in partnership with this messenger, this one God would send, that Moses can fulfill his call and bring the people up into the land, the promised land. Now, realize something. And there's really no debate about this, and that is that, that Moses is under the impression that when the people enter into the promised land, that concludes everything. Because with the entrance into the land, the kingdom, the purpose of God is fulfilled, the kingdom begins. Now we know that the exodus from Egypt is a paradigm. I mentioned this last week. It gives us a vantage point for understanding the real Passover. What's that real Passover? Messiah's Passover. He is the Lamb of God. So the Passover 3,500 years ago in Egypt just is a picture of the true Passover Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection. And ultimately, the entrance out of this world into the kingdom of God. So what we're seeing tonight in this passage teaches us new covenant truth. And the messenger, his purpose and his identity. It's the Messiah. So look again at this text. He says, see, and the implication is, see, O Lord, you say unto me, bring up this people. But here's the problem. You have not made known to me whom you will send with me. I can't do it alone. I need this partner, this messenger. And Moses is still speaking and he says, God, you have said, I know you by name. Now, this is God speaking to Moses. Moses is simply restating it. He says, God, you have said unto me that you know me by name. How did that come about? See, the Torah here gives a very important principle, a spiritual truth. God acknowledges Moses because of what reason? Look at the last part of verse 12. And also... This word, vegam, unites what he's just said with what he's going to say. The reason why God knows Moses in this unique way, that he's acknowledging Moses, is because, look at what the text says, because uh, you have found grace in my eyes, meaning this. God acknowledges Moses because Moses has found grace in the eyes of God. 
And it was only, and, and be aware of this, it is an important foundational biblical truth. It is only through the grace of God that God will acknowledge you, that he will bring you into his kingdom. In the same way that Moses is saying, God, through grace, you have acknowledged me, and I will be brought into the promised land. That is Moses' expectations. But notice something else. Verse 13. And now, since, please, I have found grace in your eyes. Moses is speaking. It says, since, not if, but since, I have found grace in your eyes. Make known to me, please, and I want to emphasize that two times, and some Bibles leave this out, the translations, but the Hebrew has it. And we should honor the words, all the words of the text. So God is revealing as Moses speaks that Moses is saying, please, twice he says, please, O Lord, since I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, please make known to me, please, and here's the key, your way. Now, notice, your way, we think of this as a, a pathway, a road. But based upon context, what has Moses asked? He says, you haven't made known to me whom. This is a person, not a thing, a person that you will send with me to bring the people up from Egypt into the promised land. So your way is a person. And the reason why I chose John chapter 14, verse 6, is because Messiah, I believe, related to this passage when he says, I am the way. And notice the benefits here of the way. When you know the way, you're going to know God, the whole passage. And now, since please, I have found grace in your eyes. Make known to me, please, your way. And what's the outcome? That I will know you. Only through grace, only through the way can Moses know God. On account of, and he repeats it again over and over, we see this, on account of, I have found grace in your eyes. So all of this, having access to the knowledge of God, knowing the way of God, and this messenger, it is all based upon God being gracious to Moses, that Moses has found grace in your eyes, O oh God. And see, and this is the second time this word appears in this passage, and see that your people recognize, I get it, God, he's saying, recognize that your people is this nation. Now, he uses a term here. He says, Amcha Hagoi Hazen. Your people is this goy. Now, many of you know that the term goy oftentimes is spoken of or translated as Gentile. So why would Moses use this term? Well, he's thinking covenantal. There's always a connection between this messenger, the way, the one who is going to bring about the fulfillment of God's will in a person's life. We're speaking about Messiah. And here's the key. There's always a connection between God's grace and Messiah and the purposes of God being accomplished. So he says here, in regard to Messiah, he quotes a reference to the Abrahamic covenant. Now, why do I bring in the Abrahamic covenant? Because the covenant says that God is going to make Avraham into Goy Gadol, a great people, a great nation, and he uses that same word Goy. So the scholars teach us, rabbinical scholars, and they're right, that when Israel is called a Goy, it's always in regard to 
the fulfillment of God's purposes, his plans, so that the Abrahamic covenant can be mediated and released in full. And what's that? A kingdom experience. So Moses, he's revealing to us a kingdom experience. Now Moses thinks it's just on the horizon. But we know that this is just a paradigm to teach us about what's going to happen when ultimately God's purpose, his will is fulfilled among Israel, this, this goy, this people, this nation. Verse 14. And he said, my presence, so Moses is speaking, and he says concerning God, my presence will go, and the implication is lead you, will go, and I will give to you rest. So in actuality, when it says, and he said, it's God, not Moses. And God said, my face will go, and the implication will lead you, and I will give to you rest. Now, I would highlight that expression, I will give to you rest. Why? Well, rest, usually when we think of rest, what comes into our mind? Yom Menucha. What is the day of rest? Shabbat. But biblically, and we see this prophetically, and we see it in the New Covenant, that there is a relationship between Sabbath and kingdom. When we talk about Sabbath and applying Sabbath relevance to our life, Sabbath truth to our life, that Sabbath truth gives us a foretaste of kingdom truth, kingdom experience. And therefore, what we find is that this messenger, he is going to bring us into rest, bring us into the kingdom, and this parallels Israel being brought into the promised land. Now, I want you to look again at verse 14 because where it says, and he said, my face, this can also, the word panim, this is the abbreviated form of this in the construct, first person possessive, where it says, panai, my face or my presence. In the scripture, the term face, that word panim, can also be understood as presence. So my face, my presence will go before you and I will give you rest. Now realize, there's also a correlation between the face of God and blessing. Now I'm gonna tell you what that correlation is because if I don't, I get a lot of emails. So instead of answering all the individual emails, I'll just answer right now. You'll recall that in Matthew, Matthew's gospel, Messiah is speaking about little ones, children. And he speaks about their angels. So each child has at least two angels, maybe more. And Messiah says concerning these angels of the little ones, the children, he says, they always find the face of God. What does that mean? Well, the term face of God can relate to God's presence, but also blessing. So the angels are always blessed to achieve their objective. And what we find here that is in the kingdom of God, that we experience the fullness of his presence and his blessings. And that's why this passage is so significant. He says, my presence will go before lead you, and I will give you rest, verse 15. And he said to him, if your face, your presence, does not go, then you do not go up from this place. So here Moses is realizing something. Look again at verse 15. And he said unto him, if your presence... Now, Moses is speaking to God. If your presence does not go, the idea here is, is before us, then, then you do not bring up, meaning us, from this place. It's only 
with God? Can the purposes of God be fulfilled? That's what verse 15 is saying. Verse 16. And with what will it be known, therefore, that I have found grace in your eyes? Now he's saying, with what? What is the sign that I have found grace in your eyes? And he says, I and your people surely will go before you that you will go with us. So he says, I and your people, surely you will go with us. And with God leading the people, notice the outcome of this. I want to say this carefully because verse 16, very significant verse. And with what will be known, therefore, that I have found grace in your eyes. Here's how. The people, we know that grace is upon Moses. He says, I and your people, Moses and the people of Israel, surely you will go with us. So grace brings about the presence of God among his people. And what's the outcome of this? Well, notice the next word, ve-nif-lenu. Now, this word, pe lamed he, it's a word for, we might say, discrimination. Discrimination in a good sense. Now, we know that God makes a distinction between his people and the rest of the world. And the way that this decision of him distinguishing his people. How that comes about is because grace has been found. God's presence is there. And because of that, the people of God become unique. They distinguish themselves because God is leading them, God is with them, and they are recipients of God's grace. So he says, I, that's Moses, and your people, the children of Israel, Surely you will go with us. And as a result of that, you will distinguish us, I and your people from all the people which are upon the face of the ground, meaning on this planet. So God's purpose through grace, his presence, and and his purpose, Israel will become distinguished. And that is what every believer should be. We should become unique, a peculiar people. Verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, Also, this thing which you have spoken about God leading the people, God distinguishing them, God going with them, he says, This thing, Moses, which which you have spoken, he says, I will do. Why is God going to do it? Why is God going to move? Why is his presence going to be there? Why is God going to distinguish? For one reason, grace. He says, because you have found grace in my eyes, and I know you by name. Now, I would highlight that. It is through God's grace that Moses received that Moses became known to God. Now you say, well, doesn't God know everything? Yes, he does. Doesn't God know everybody? Yes, he does. But this is the word that that is a powerful word for knowing. It's experiential. And here's what we need to see. Let me give you a New Testament passage that helps us understand it. And that is when Messiah says at times, I never knew you. Does that mean God doesn't know the name of that person, didn't know that person was born? Of course not. But what it says is God is not acknowledging that purpose, person with his purpose, with his kingdom reality. God is rejecting. But Moses, when he says, I know you by name, God is acknowledging. Here's a scripture that I want you to think about for a moment. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of that seventh chapter. 
And I just watched a little clip of an individual. He's also a Messianic believer. And this individual was teaching at a conference. In fact, he answers a lot of questions. He has a short television show where he answers questions. And someone asked him about this passage from Matthew 7. And let me just simply say, his answer was not correct. His answer was far away from the intent of the scripture. This person who asked a question, a young woman says, can you help me understand this passage where it says in Matthew 7, the Lord is speaking and he says, not everyone who calls me Lord, not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now he makes that statement and what happens, there's a group of people, and they try to justify themselves that they'll be in the kingdom. And they said, Lord, did we not do mighty deeds? Did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons all in your name? And what does he say? He says, I tell you, I never knew you. Now, this is this concept of knowing, meaning recognize for the purposes of God, a kingdom reality. God is rejecting them. Why? Well, it's very simple. God makes a statement. Not everyone who says to Messiah, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God. And the right response should be this. That's right. Only those, and this is what we're being taught in Exodus 33, only those who have received God's grace, those who received mercy from him, it is only by the grace of God that comes through that messenger, the servant, Messiah, the way, the truth, and the life. It's only through him and his work on the cross that grace is available. So, yes, not everyone who just simply says, Lord, Lord, those are not magical words that get you into the kingdom of God, that causes God to recognize you eternally. No, it is the grace of God. It is acknowledgement. So the right thing when someone, when Messiah says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God, one should not say, but what have I done? These great things I prophesied, done mighty deeds and cast out demons? No. Just say, you're right, O Lord. Only those who acknowledge their sinfulness and trust in your work on the cross as a free gift, as grace, only them who confess their sins, believing in their heart that you died for their sins and that you rose on the third day from the dead, those are the ones by grace that will be in the kingdom of God that you will acknowledge. If those individuals would have said that instead of pointing to what they have done, a, a works justification, he would have acknowledged them, but because they look to their works to justify themselves, he says, I never knew you. But because Moses has found grace in the eyes of God. What do we find here? God saying here that, that I have known you by name. Verse 18. And he said, show me, please, your glory. Now, up until this time, there's been an emphasis on the word panim, the presence of God. Of God and the outcome of experiencing God's presence in your life that manifests the glory of God so that's what Moses is when he says God I want you to come into your my life I want your presence to lead me guide me direct me so in the end your glory is manifested and notice God's response verse 19 God has said I'm going to agree but with a stipulation, with conditions. He says, I will pass all to V. To V is my goodness. Now, goodness, that word good is related, and I hope you know this, to God's will. We see a relationship between God's glory and his will being done. We see a relationship between God's presence being manifested and God's glory being revealed. So verse 18, Moses says, show me, please, your glory. 
and verse 19, God says, I will pass all my goodness before your face. And I will call in the name of the Lord before you. Now, name is synonymous with what? God's character. So he's going to reveal one of the chief aspects of God's character. And what is that? Look at the end of verse 19, where he says, I will be gracious upon whom I will be gracious, and I will be merciful upon whom I will be merciful. Now, it's all related to God's grace and his mercy. We can never experience God's presence. We will not be instruments of his glory. We will not arrive at the, the place God wants us to be, accomplishing the things that he has given us to do, unless we are recipients of the grace of God, the mercy of God. And that's what initiates God at work in our life, bringing about his purposes in our life and through our life. Verse 20, God is still speaking to Moses and he says, he says, you are not able to see my face for you cannot, a man cannot see me and live. Now, that is an important statement. A man cannot see me and live. Now, realize, this was because the redemption that the children of Israel received in Egypt was a physical redemption. Did it have some spiritual implications? Obviously it did. But it was not through the blood of the Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua, but from the blood of, of sheep and goat. It, it personified or it was a figure of what was coming that was greater the very work of the Lamb of God, Messiah, Yeshua. So he says, You are not able to see my face, for no man is able to see me and live. Verse 21. And the Lord says, Behold, a place. Now, I would invite you to pay very close attention to what your translation is saying. And the reason why you should have a scripture, the Bible, in front of you. Don't be lazy and just sit back and listen. Have the word of God in front of you. Because what I say in regard to the translation, when it's different from yours, if you're looking at it, it's going to pay, you're going to pay attention to that and you're going to remember what, what, why the difference is. Here's the example. Look at verse 21. The Lord said, Behold, always that word behold says pay attention to what's coming. It's significant. Makom. Makom is place. Makom iti. Now, I say that in Hebrew because I want you to know that I've paid close attention to the language here. Something important is being stated. For example, many translations, the New American Standard, for example, says a place by me. There is absolutely no way that you can translate the phrase et with me as by me. By me shows a separation. It's by me. With me, intimacy, togetherness. And why is that so important? Because there's a place with me. Who's speaking? God. And God says there's a place with me and you will be stood. So God is placing Moses on this place, and notice, upon, what does your Bible say? A rock? No. Hatsur, the rock. And let me remind you that that term, the rock, is one of the phrases that is used in regard to Messiah. Surah Yeshua, the rock. Of salvation so here we're talking about this messenger the one who is the way this presence of God and who is this this messenger who is the way who is the representative of the presence of God it's the rock of our salvation Messiah that's why Yeshua says I'm the way 
the truth and the life. So God is saying to Moses, behold, pay attention to this. A place with me and you will be stood upon the rock. Verse 22. And it shall come about when my glory passes that I will set you in the cliff of the rock. Now notice just not on the rock, but now in the cliff. Now what is that speaking? It's speaking about him being in the rock. Why is that important? Well, one of the things that Paul says so frequently in his epistles, he emphasizes so much of his theological truth that he reveals has to do with one being in Messiah. In fact, until you're in Messiah, no theological truth is really going to bring change into your life. You have to first be in Messiah. So notice this change. You're standing on the rock, but he says, and I will set you personal work by God. I will set you in the cliff of the rock and I will cover my my hand will cover you. Now, the word here for cover, I mentioned about the holidays, the Feast of Tabernacles, for example. And we dwell in booths during the Feast of Tabernacles to remember the time in the wilderness. And the roof of a sukkah is called, it's made with skach. Skach is, is those, brand, it could be of various things, but it's a covering. And this is what he says here. He uses that same word, my hand. And it's not hand. The word yad refers to your hand up to this portion of a man or a woman's body. But this is a word kaf. That's this part, the, the, the palm of a hand. And he says here, my palm will cover you until I Pass, verse 23. And once God passes, notice what he says, verse 23, our last verse. And I will remove my palm, and you shall see my back. Now, remember what he says. No man can see my face and live. So God is saying at this time, you, there's going to be a covering of you in order that when I remove it, he says, you shall see my back, but my face will not be seen. So this speaks about how we should be looking for a greater fulfillment. And that one who's going to make that greater fulfillment a reality it's through these same principles of redemption, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the presence of God, his leadership for the purpose of manifesting his glory. But God's servant, Messiah, the very son of God, he is going to bring about a New Testament fulfillment of this passage from Exodus 33. It is a wonderful testimony of what God did uniquely in the life of Moses one time to show us a spiritual journey that we can't do it by ourselves. We need that one that God has sent and that we will be acknowledged by God through his grace, that his presence will bring about a transformation in our life whereby God will lead us into fulfillment of his will so his glory can be manifested. And in the end, the greatest outcome of that is intimacy. That's what Mo Moses received. When he was in that rock, that intimacy with Messiah himself. Well, I'll close with that until next week, and we begin chapter 34 of the book of Exodus. Until then, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. 
There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>